Hello everyone, welcome to another installation of our National Family History Month Talks for Library Tasmania. Um, I welcome you all as well as everyone that's on our webinar. Um, these talks are being recorded for those that don't get to see them today with their webinar registration, so you will be able to see them on YouTube uh, probably in, uh, I would say, September we're looking at. Um, so today we're welcoming Marina Lidonushki, I hope I'm saying that correctly, <laughs> who will be taking us through her research into Ukrainian family history in Tasmania. And um, before we begin, I would like to offer our welcome to country. Um, Libraries Tasmania recognises the deep histories and cultures of the Aboriginal people of Lutruwita, Tasmania. We acknowledge Aborigin Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional and continuing custodians of the land, waters and sky. We pay respect to the elders past and present who hold the memories, traditions, culture and knowledge of country. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose countries were never ceded. So thank you. We welcome Marina. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much um, for the welcome. I'm really, really happy to be here. So thank you very much for the invitation to talk. Um, so my name is Marina Ladaniski. Um, as I said, I'm really glad that you're here um, to come on the journey that is Ukrainian family history. Um, at a time like this, when the invasion of Ukraine has just destroyed so much, um, but inspired so many, um, our personal journeys to understand um, our past have a much broader significance, um, as well as being a conduit to the lives of our past, mem uh, past family members. Conversations about, about history also encourage us to think about culture and language and bring that history to the present, which at, the time, at this time is, is so very important. So whatever your reason for attending today, whether it's because you have a friend or a family member who's Ukrainian, whether you're just interested, uh, um, whether you just want to know more or you're curious, I hope you find it interesting and learn something new and maybe just get a nugget of information that um, that makes you dream something interesting. Um, all right, so how do we spend the next 50 minutes or an hour or so together? So I'll give a bit of an introduction of my background and experience so you know where I'm coming from with the, with the topic. Um, and a few disclaimers as well. And then we'll talk about key themes and challenges in Ukrainian history research briefly, because this will be touched on as we go through the presentation. Um, there are three key areas that I wanted to focus on today. One is the pre-Stalinist um, pre sort of era, so taking history right back so that we get an understanding of what the borders and things looked like over time, because that, of course, informs how we do our history. Um, how we do the history, how we do our history research is probably a better term. Then we'll look at the Soviet um, uh, area, sorry, the Stalinist period and look at sources that are available then. And I'm really excited because I learned some new things doing preparing for this. I really want to share that with you. Um, and then we'll focus predominantly um, on the post-World War II period, looking at who came, when they came, how they came, and the sources that are related to the Australian um, migration experience as well. And of course, in the context of all that, we'll focus on Tasmania because we have, do have a, a community here and we've published a, a book over there with, with Ukrainian greetings. So you're always welcome to follow through with that and find more information. So without further ado, let's get started. So um, as a third generation Ukrainian Australian, my story begins remembering lunch at my Ukrainian grandmother's house, at my brother's house, um, with the rest of my family in Springfield, where those many of those who settled in that post-World War II period in Hobart lived. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, I remember attending a church at the Ukrainian Hall in Moona with a very strong smell of incense um, and reading an alphabet that looks so very different from what I was used to. And I'm convinced that those early experiences led to a curiosity about other cultures and other languages. So in college, I studied history and continued that at university, um, always with a focus on social history. Um, I completed an 
honours thesis, which I've got with me, you're welcome to have a look at that, um, which talks about displaced persons specifically um, in Tasmania during 1948 to 1952, um, and looking at how they negotiated the structures um, that they were working within at that time. It sought to examine um, how they could negotiate and concluded, amongst other things, that without further um, involvement with the community, my journey um, into the archives couldn't really go much further. So I'm very privileged to um, uh, later on work with the community in that way. So I was at Catholic Care for over 10 years, working with migrants and humanitarian entrants. Um, and at that time, started to become involved with the Association of Ukrainians in Tasmania. So I was the first dance teacher for several years and started in 2011. Um, and was on the committee and president um, and then on the committee again until recently recently. So I was fortunate while, whilst I was president to lead the production of that um, publication, which was developed because through the process of celebrating 70 years of Ukrainian settlement in Australia. Um, and it was researched by our team, so it includes the results of oral history interviews, translations of minutes, translations of documents, photo collections, all of which was done for the first time then. Um, we didn't write it, but we contributed significantly to the drafting of the publication. I was um, sent also, also given a presentation recently about post-World War II migration. So this presentation is much more specific, looking at family history. So this leads me to a few disclaimers. Um, I'm a passionate advocate for our community. Um, I have an interest in the history and its people. Um, the information that's here is a guide only, so I would encourage you to do your own research and verify the sources that you find, particularly when they're not in a national archival system, because um, we'll talk a bit more about those sources as we go through. Um, there are professional genealogy services available um, if you need them. Um, and whilst I might not know all the answers, I hope to point you in some directions where you can start your journey or explore what's interesting for you. So, um, and just a note before we move on, that beautiful embroidery that was on that front um, page, that is from um, the Borshchev region of Ukraine that existed, or Borshchev embroidery, sorry, that existed over 500 years ago, and it's where my grandfather was from in that era. So this um, presentation is quite unashamedly about sources. It doesn't really delve too much into the culture or uh, because we'd need another three or four, five, six hundred hours to talk about that. So um, just keep that in mind as you go through. All right. So considerations. And I'm sure if you do have a background in researching this time in history, you may be aware of some of these, but it's worth highlighting just as we go through. So the borders of Ukraine, Ukraine only became an independent country in 1991, um, but the history of you know, nationalism and building that identity um, is you know, obviously a long time before that. So the borders of Ukraine have shifted and moved according to who has occupied the territory over time. So when you are researching the history, it's really important to be mindful of language, which country your resources might be. For example, if you're, if you're researching Western Ukraine, the sources might be located in Poland rather than in Ukraine or, or other countries. Um, so we just need to be mindful of that. And also, if you're interested in linguistics, the translation duration of words. So my surname is Leda, um, if I'm, because I'm a female, it's Leda Nivska, right? But in the, the, the system, it's Leda Nivski. Um, and I'll look, show you a bit further in the documents later where it's written in the Polish way, Leda Nivska, uh, sorry, Leda Nowski. So if I didn't know that, I wouldn't be able to find that in the record. So it's really important to be aware of those things. Um, Obviously, then we also have to look at primary documents. So things that were generated by an agency, um, why were they generated? How were they generated? What's the implication if they're not there? Doesn't mean they don't exist. This might be in a private collection or they might be somewhere else. So we have to think about that too. 
Um, and then the final point there, which is what I alluded to at the beginning, is around private collections and investigations. So I've in the handout that we have floating around, there is some websites on the back which are, are really suggestions. They're a collection, they're a database that people have contributed to, put together, um, because they're interested in those things. So I went down a few rabbit warrens in the last couple of weeks, and if you start doing that, I'm sure you will as well. Um, so be very open minded but also just be mindful of what you're looking at and some of the you know the um the things you need to think about why was it generated where did this come from these kinds of questions all very basic if you're a history of if you're a student of history all right we'll move on part one shifting borders so i just bear with me here all right so i have skipped a lot of information because we're talking about 2000 years <laughs> worth of history so i just wanted to give you an overview of um some of the i guess the key points in history so ukrainians identify as descending from the slavic tribes which settled in the era in the area that we know of as modern ukraine around the fourth century um the Kievan Rus state, hopefully you can see, see that it's the top left, it's the left picture, um, occupied a large part of modern Ukraine, which included a number of East Slavic peoples. And the modern Ukrainian state is traced back to this, this time in history. Um, in 1988, the ruler of the Kievan Rus, Voldemir um, the Great, officially accepted Christianity, and by the 11th century, Kyiv was the centre of civilization in modern Europe. It's interesting to note that from 1187 to 1189, a Kyivian chronicler uses the word Ukraine for the first time to describe a region of what we now know as modern Ukraine. Um, the Kyivian rural state was weakened by the Mongol invasions during the 13th century. Um, and as a result, from the 14th to the 18th century, portions of Ukraine were ruled by various empires including the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the Austrian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Tsardom of Russia. So I could, as I said, 14th, 18th century, summarised in three sentences. It doesn't really do it justice, but otherwise we would be here for quite some time. So one important um, thing I wanted to mention um, at this point is around the legend of the Cossacks. So has anyone heard of the Cossacks? Who's in front of me? No? Well, lucky you may have Philip, but it's lucky. I'll um luck, lucky I'm here to tell you about it. So we can trace the first mention of the Ukrainian Cossacks in history to 1492. Um, and the historian Serhi Ploki, which I have his um, book over there, traces the development between 1590 and 1638 as a military and social order. So they actually developed um, in response to um, some of the um, occupations around that time. Um, and the, the Cossack is a really significant figure in Ukrainian culture. It signifies strength and, you know, um, you know there's lots of dances and symbols that, um, that, are, that are represented in this. So if you go to Google, look up Ukrainian Cossack and you'll find some interesting material. So in 1648, under the Hetman... Bodan Mensky, he led a rebellion against Polish rule and established an independent Cossack state. In 1654, there was a treaty between Ukraine and Muscovy, as Russia was then called. However, in 1778, 1775, the Zaporizhian the military camp of the Ukrainian Cossacks on the river Dnipro, the main river in Ukraine, was destroyed by Catherine II and serfdom was introduced to Ukraine. So between 772 and 1795, parts of Poland and Polish occupied Ukraine was divided between Russia, Russia and Austria. So this is those maps up there. There's one on the, I think on the left side, you have the, the Cossack um, Hetman, um, sorry, the Cossack region. And then on this side here on the right is looking at those partitions and dividing up of land that occur. So as we move forward into history, after World I and the Russian, in, um, the Russian Revolution of 1917, Ukraine became independent for a short time, just a couple of years, before most of Ukraine became a republic of the Soviet Union. 
So you can see that at that time in history, there was lots of changing of borders. You have Christianity being introduced. We have a few, there's, there was different churches in Ukraine at that time. So now we'll come to the next part, which is actually around those sources themselves. So looking into Ukrainian history requires persistence and patience um, for these reasons that I've just mentioned. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about Western Ukrainian records now. So as I said in the introduction, these might be split between Poland and Ukraine because of that, those occupations. Um, the internal administrative borders changed and parish and state boundaries differ. They weren't always the same. So if we're looking at metrical or vital records, which are those um, maintained by the clergy, Ukraine, um, as I said before, has a, has a variety of different um, religions in, within its territory. There's a Greek, or, um, Greek Catholic Church, a Roman Catholic Church, the Ju um, Ju sorry, Judaic, Protestant and Christian Orthodox. So the, the difference between the um, Orthodox Church and the Greek Catholic Church in Ukrainian is you know, um, we've got some of those Byzantinian rite and some of those Orthodox type um, rituals are included in the Ukrainian Catholic Church um, because of the schism and the situation that happened in, the, in, in Christianity at that time. So, so it is a really um, interesting mix. Um, so birth records are held by the state archives for each oblast. So an oblast is an administrative region in Ukraine if they are over 70 years old and they're open to people who want to have a look. However, um, proof of kinship is required at civil registry offices for new records, so those less than 70 years old. However, contain important information, so name, date of birth, baptism, um, baptismal name, social status of the parents, gender, obstetrician, and the priest's name. So if you can access them, which obviously at the moment is a challenge, um, that could give you a good lead. And I've just got an example of what that might look like. So this was actually written in Latin. So we add Latin into our realm of languages that we all must know when we're looking into this space. Um, and I cannot read Latin, but I thought it would give you a good, just an idea instead of some text about what those records might look like. This, the other um, record that might, you might find interesting is after the incorporation of Galicia um, within Austria-Hungary, two lands surveys were conducted, which resulted in the creation of volumes of these maps, cadastral maps, um, showing numbered land parcels and buildings. So these maps can be useful in determining locations of family homes and land. So if you have um, family that, and there's a map further in the presentation at the beginning, which had that Galicia um, area uh, visible. So if you kind of know where your family might be from, this could be a good record. Um, and the people um, who wrote this website who actually found this information suggest overlapping the Google um, Google Maps with these map with these maps, so you can try and identify where that might be. They're usually kept at the historical archives for each oblast, so for each administrative region. Other records, such as school records, can be challenging. Um, to find, but I found this voting records um, between 1918 and 1939, um, the Polish uh, Republic operated briefly before World War II, um, so you might be able to find some interesting information there because it's got names and birth dates and so on, as long as you know what you're looking for. Okay. Better keep talking, otherwise we'll run out of time. So again, in your handout, don't feel like you need to write down all these um, web websites. I've listed them. So there are some examples of um, historic of the archives in Western Ukraine and links. I've went, I've been through most of them. There in there are some things you can access online. Some you have to go and visit personally, but at least you know that they're there, and that's the first step. All right, other information. Um, this was really interesting. It's a, I haven't got an image, but it's the Institute of History of Ukraine, which is a research institute and part of the National Academy of Sciences. 
they have, I tried to find my grandfather's, um, um, sorry, grandfather's village, and they have books of village names and cities um, that are available. Again, I'm not sure. You can see the image on the, of the book. Uh, how, as to how much is digitised is something different. So I'd encourage you to go through and have a look and see what you can find. This is based in Kiev, this particular institute. Uh, genealogy, genealogical resources. So as I said, there is a variety of different sources out there, people investigating and looking into history and you never know what you're going to find. Um, there's a few there around Western Ukraine, there's a, quite a lot around Jewish ancestry, obviously because of the events of, you know, centuries that there's been a lot of research in that space. So even if you are not of Jewish heritage yourself, um, you might find some interesting information. Um, this digitisation projects, um, which I've got there, if you're not, if it, does, it seems like if you don't log in to actually uh, and create an account, you can't access the information. But they have digitised, you know, millions of of pages of data. So it could be a good start um, in terms of just scanning what's out there. Okay, so we've covered the first eighteen hundred years <laughs> in how long? Fifteen minutes. Okay, so we're doing well. We'll now move into the second um, part of the presentation which is looking at Stalinist policies and consequences. So, of course, this is a rather um, a bleak time in history. Um, I don't need to give you too much of too much of the general, but I'll just, for the sake of context, I'll do that. So the initial Soviet policy on Ukrainian language and culture actually made Ukraine the official language of administration and schools for a really short time. However, following Lenin's death in 1924, Joseph Stalin came to power and we know those policies. So rapid industrialisation, forced collectivisation um, of, um, of the farms. Ukraine is very rural, it's farm-based, it's agrar agrarian, so that obviously had a massive impact on the population. Um, in Ukrainian, we call the whole of the war. So the deliberate man-made famine um, from 1930 to 1933, that killed millions of people. So the estimate is as high as 10 during that period, which is, you know, it's a, uh, as I said, a bleak time in history. Um, the, you know, other policies, um, the labour camp, the labour camp system of the Gulag was expanded during this period as well, and Stalin conducted the Great Purge from 1936 to 38, which was to remove his actual and perceived political opponents. During this time, the policies turned to Russification, so we start to see that implementation of Russian-only um, language in the Ukrainian territories and suppression of any expression of Ukrainian nationalism or Ukrainian culture. So I was very... Um, uh, very privileged to have a conversation with someone in the community who gave me an insight into a whole breadth of resources in this time period that I would not have known about otherwise. She knows who she is if she's listening, but it's a really it was really important because um, if you have family, particularly from the sort of central region across to the east, um, these sources will be um, will be useful. So. This, the source that I'm showing you now is um, from a database of the victims of political terror in the USSR. It's actually in Russian, but if you use your Google Translate, it actually doesn't come up too badly. So the International Memorial Society in early um, December came from St Petersburg to present this updated electronic database. Um, 30 years ago, so around the time of independence and the breakup of the Soviet Union, people wanted to know what had happened to their families. And it was actually um, some Russian citizens who started this process at that time. Um, I'm just having a look at the at the statistics. So, you know, some people collected 20 names, some gathered 1,000, some people took 10,000. It was a joint collective effort to establish these stories. Um, and I think, you know, they have million records, lots, a lot of records now. And what you see here is actually 
a record of someone who was deported as a dangerous element. Um, in 1935, he worked as a driver, um, was arrested, and then the Troika are basically a three-person court of the Stalinist um, regime at that time, um, and he was sentenced to death um, and shot in San Zamok, which I'll show you an image of that place in a minute. So, you know, you, there are thousands of these sorts of records. So if you do have family in that at that time, it is a good place to find more information of what had happened to them. Um, as an example of some of the information that had been gathered. So I just pulled this off the off the internet. It's a um, memorial plaque from Nina uh, Porofimba Costina. Um, Sandamok during the year of the Great Terror, um, 5,130 residents of Karelia and prisoners of the White Sea Baltic camp were executed. Um, and uh, in this in this space, 1,000 and 11 prisoners of, a, of Solovetsky prison. So although it is a very sad way or, you know, to, to find, to look into history, these sorts of sources, these sorts of databases, there's a lot of information that's been gathered. Um, and I've just got three other websites there which are around people who were oppressed by the state for political reasons. Um, there's victim. There's another website dedicated to victims of political terror, and also there is a website which is records those who participated in military in the military in Russia. So if your family was under occupation or was in that region and was forced to or did um, participate in the military, then that could also provide you more information. So I hope, you know, given the situation in Ukraine at the moment, some of these websites are, you know, Russian-based, so hopefully we can continue to access them. Okay. So I have skipped, a, you know, a little bit quickly through some of that because I'd like to get you through to that this post-World War II period um, in time. So if anyone has any questions, I think we've got about 10 minutes at the end, um, if you would like to ask me anything further. As I said, I might not be able to answer it, but I can might be able to point you where you might be able to find the information. Okay. So just bear with me. So just to recap then, we've talked about the really early history. We've talked about the Stalinist period. Um, and it's about this point that we start to um, look at migration to Australia. So after the Soviet Union um, and Nazi Germany invaded Poland during World War One in September 1939, um, the Ukrainian um, Republic territory expanded westward. So the Ukraine actually had a Soviet Socialist um, Republic at, at that time, and the Axis armies occupied Ukraine from 1941 to 1944. So by the end of the war, the borders of Ukraine of the Ukrainian SSR had been redrawn to include the Western territories, which is what this slide um, shows you. And this is the first time in history that Western Ukraine had been under Soviet occupation. So until now, that region of Ukraine had been part of Poland and the um, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth and all these other powers, um, which made that area a really strong base of Ukrainian nationalism because they didn't have that suppression like other areas of Ukraine. Okay, so after World War One, there are estimates that there were one million displaced people in West Germany, France, Italy, and Germany, and to resolve this you know, and resolve how to support or help um, the displaced people in that region. Countries um, like Australia arranged agreements with the International, International Refugee Organisation to um, take people, and Australia did so in the form of a two-year work contract. So people came to Australia and they had to work two years um, before they could be granted permanent, before they could be granted citizenship. So Australia accepted approximately 21,000 people, um, 21,000 Ukrainians, sorry, over a total amount of 170,000. In Tasmania at that time, we think about 350 people came of Ukrainian background. 
Okay, sorry. And of course, that was, and have we all heard the term out of the Prime Minister at the time, populate or perish? So basically trying to get a lot of people into Australia to support the economy. Okay. So before we head into the Australian sources and what happened once people got here, I wanted to just show you a few um, a few sources that would help you understand the journey that people came, to, how people came to Australia. So it was a gentleman in Melbourne who put me onto this website, the Arrelson Archives, which is the International Centre on Nazi Persecution. It's actually based in Germany. Um, it has a huge number of records that have been scanned and put online. The records are in German, most the ones that I could see. Um, but I did find one from my grandfather and his relative. So it's Again, you can canvas a broad database and see what you can find, or you might find lots or you might not find anything. It depends on where you're looking and what region the family came from. So in Ukraine, I'll just take it one back one step. So the number of people, the people that, that we're talking about who would be in this archive, Ukraine was one of the areas that was invaded by the Nazis who... who and those people were transported to Germany for labour. Civilians could have fled invasion of their home country. Um, other people had been soldiers who'd been released from German prisoner of war camps. They had little or no money. So they were in these camps for a variety of reasons. But um, people like my grandmother were taken there because of slave labour, basically. All right. So if we're looking at displaced persons camps, so what happened to the people after the World War um, II finished, these, and you know how I've said a disclaimer on sources at the beginning of this presentation? So these two are from um, a website called www.dpcamps.org um, and also from um, a, friend, a gentleman in Melbourne who provided me with these maps. So they've got information there around sort of the numbers of Ukrainians that may have been in each each camp, um, and if you, I can, well, you can go up and have a close look um, later. I, I can also maybe print out a larger, a larger print if you're interested. So the U, United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Organisation was established in 1943, and then the function of the camps was overtaken by the International Refugee Organisation um, after World War II, which so it was dissolved in 1948 which is why you have the UNRRA map on the left and the um, the second map on the right, because they are run by separate organisations, basically. Okay. So people came from these camps on ships to Australia. That was the primary primary way. Some people came by air. Um, there may have been some a little bit of variation in how people came, but most of them came in this way. There were 157 um, ships between 1947 and 1953, most arriving in Melbourne and Sydney and other ports um, in Newcastle, Fremantle and Adelaide. Um, there are two really important, uh, two really good websites which you can access. One is the Fifth Fleet, which has information about the ships and when they arrived. And the other one is the nominal, which is actually the nominal roles of those ships which, which have been transcribed. So you can find family in those nominal roles. Okay. So if we so we've got we've come from Ukraine, come from Germany, we're coming to Australia. And of course, in interacting with Australian authorities, there would be some record associated with that. So non-British subjects coming to um, Australia had to complete an incoming passenger card. Um, they are stored in the archived, archives of the state where they settled, so not where they arrived originally, but where they settled. Um, so this series, P1185, is located in, it's actually in the archives office here, so the National Archives Office. Um, as you can see, it has a variety of information, the, the passenger cards. It's sort of got name, date of birth, um, port of destination, and a lot of other information. Um, and 
just again, just using examples from my own background. So this one here is in the National Archives as a, a Polish, uh, as saying my grandmother is Polish. Um, it's been crossed out here and she's got UKR written there. I think it's UKR, so it could be Ukrainian, but it's in the record as being Polish because she was from the, the Western region of Ukraine. Um, so there's this source here. And then if we look, and the, the next available, I guess, source of information is looking at what happened once they left the ship. So people would come to migrant reception and training centres, um, which operated between the 1940s and the, and the 1980s. Um, they were initial tra training centres where people learned about learned English and learned about the Australian way of life, whatever, whatever um, that looks like. And so the various centres, the, the main one maybe you're aware of is Bonagilla, so that was the largest um, reception air, uh, camp in Victoria. Nearly half of displaced persons came to this camp, which is quite a significant number. The, next, the other large um, training centre was Greta in New South Wales, Wakol in Queensland, and in Western Australia there were several. Um, but the Bonagilla um, Training Centre actually has records of everyone who went through it. So in the case of my grandparents, by the time they got to Bonagilla, they're actually recognised as Ukrainian rather than Polish. So it's a interesting, which is why when we reflect back to that first slide, thinking about regions where people are from, the language that we're using. Okay. So in Tasmania, we had a migrant hostel. So we didn't have a my, um, migrant training and reception centre. We had a hostel, which fulfilled a different function. Um, the first 200 married couples, not just of Ukrainian background, but of other backgrounds as well, came on 15th of July 1949, 1949, and the camp closed in 1951. Efforts to establish other centres in Burnie, Devonport, Glenorchy and Mowbray didn't happen. Um, the, re the archives are really interesting. They talk about why it didn't happen. There's a bit of community opposition. It wasn't the right spot to have it. Um, may not be necessary. So it's a very, very interesting um, reading. And so some people went directly from the larger training camps to the migrant hostel, uh, migrant hostel, but others went directly to their place of employment rather than going through here. Obviously, if you're in the north of the state, you would have gone to where you were going to be employed most likely rather than going to Hobart and then going back up. So in terms of this particular the hostel, we don't have a record of the families who arrived, but um, we do have administrative records which talk to the conditions. There was a protest, I think it was a hunger strike at one point, around the fees that people had to pay to stay at the hostel being disproportionately high. And the in, uh, the immigration minister got involved and it was all very it was taken very seriously. So as I said, there's some interesting interesting points in there. So if you're looking for information about this camp, the Agricultural Bank of Tasmania, which looked after housing at the time, and the Department of Public Health, so both Tasmanian agencies were the ones that would be where you would need to look. So I just now we've got to the point where, okay, people are here, what happens next, right? So in October 1947, there were 88,400 um, vacancies around Australia. And at this time, we also had the UK Assisted Passage Program as well. So it wasn't just displaced people coming, it was other groups as well. And between 1947 and 54, migration contributed over 30% of Tasmanian's population growth. Which is pretty, <laughs> which is pretty huge for Tasmania. Um, the group of Eastern Europeans that came around this time included Ukrainians, Polish, Lithuanians, Estonians, Yugoslavian, Czech, and I think a lot of Slovenians in there. But it's there is a, a broad number of people that came. Um, the table that you can see in the presentation, it's it's an interesting one because. Talking about citizenship is obviously problematic if you're trying to identify people at this time because Ukraine as a country didn't exist until 1991. So, but people did identify as Ukrainian. So if you look at nationality, which is where these figures are pulled from, 
this is what I considered when I did my thesis as the best indicator of numbers of people that came. So just looking at the time, I've got to speed up slightly, I think. So when people came to Tasmania, they were either in women classified as a domestic um, and, and men as labourer. That was the, the breakdown of the jobs they could do on their two-year contract. Um, they were to be placed in non-competing industries, so ones that didn't knock out people, the people who were already here, um, and they were not to receive any special treatment. So they were to be treated the same as any other worker, which meant that programs like we have today for refugees and humanitarian entrants, um, like Catholic Care, who run the um, Migrant Support Program, and Migrant Resource Centre, and things that specifically support people didn't exist. So if you are looking for family members, one thing that you might find really useful, at the back of the publication that was produced by the association, there is a list of 350 people who we identified as arriving in Tasmania at this time. Um, and this was from a combined effort of association minutes, member lists, church lists, community consultation. So it pulled together a lot of information to try and and work out who came, when they came. Um, we used, so Dr Diane Snowden compiled the list for us at the back of the book. She used incoming passenger, passenger card um, information. Um, when that wasn't available, looking at naturalisation or citizenship records and newspaper articles and whatever she could find to place people who came into, into Tasmania. So the names that appear here are not what they might now be. Um, they are what they appeared on the original documentation. Again, coming down to language and how we identify sources. So the challenges are around the differences in names on documentation, the change, change details. So some people, for example, um, change their details because they could not or did not want to go back to the Soviet Union. So there may be some, some variation as to what you might be familiar with. Um, and the anglicisation of names. So, um, which makes some of that information interesting to try and look for. Okay. And it's still being updated as well because we have people who contact us and say, oh, you know, my great grandmother or my, my, my uncle or whoever isn't there. Um, and that's just simply because the association wasn't aware of them at the time or there wasn't a record that was easily accessible. As I said, doesn't mean the person didn't exist, just means that the record, as we could find it, isn't there. Okay, so I am just going to talk quickly now about some aspects of the community in Tasmania, just to give you an idea of where you might look um, for sources if that is what you are, what your interest is. Um, I'm going to skip this one. So basically there were several different so, um, government departments that were involved in the Displaced Persons Program. The Tasmanian government actually had very little to do directly with it because the hostels were run by the national, by um, uh, federal departments and Tasmanian government departments were only responsible for their health health care or for things that affected the general population rather than specific immigration type matters. The Commonwealth Employment Service was a national um, national body and another department that and the Department of Immigration had social workers that um, went from to camps up in the Hydro and other places around Tasmania to check on individuals. Um, and uh, yeah, so there are there are different departments that dealt with dealt with different functions, but the Tasmanian government primarily didn't have a lot to do specifically. The, this means that it's really important to liaise with community, talk to people, understand where family has gone and how they got there because the finding a specific state government record for displaced people in Tasmania doesn't exist. Um, so we really need to be creative about how we're looking for our families. So the importance of, the, of, of that link between archive and community, we know that um, there was a community in the channel. We have family, we have community members here who have family who came from that time. 
The first male displaced persons um, in that region worked at the electrolytics zinc company, followed by others at the carbide company and the Goliath Portland cement company. Um, we know from that list I just put up um, that the Arms Didoka, Dobromilski, the Matreshan and Dojna families lived in that area. Um, but you can find out more at the Margate Museum because they contributed directly there um, and we did some oral history as well. So that interaction is really important. This is a, so talking about employment now, sometimes it was really hard for qualifications to be, rec well, it was hard for qualifications to be recognised because of language equivalency and so on. Um, this is a card of Johan Billick, who became a provisional member of the Boilermakers Society because he was a welder before he came to Australia. But getting full recognition was really difficult. So living in Tasmania, when people came here, they came together as a community. So Kume is the name that we use for this community connections in the absence of family. It literally means godparents, but it came to be more than that. It came to be a family. Um, the community helped, like the jet broader Australian community, helped the growing community and others in terms of building houses and, and welcoming them. It wasn't always harmonious. We know that. But... I'm sure that, you know, there were these cases where people helped, genuinely helped each other. Another aspect of living in Tasmania was the um, sharing of food and tradition. So this family here is the Petrick family. They lived in Springfield and they would walk their cow, I believe, up and down Springfield Avenue and selling um, those sorts of products or even giving them. So it's... Uh, you know, there are all these stories which is not just unique to Ukrainians, it's, it's to all other communities as well. But the strong agrarian tradition is something that is very Ukrainian. So um, community development around Australia, it's really important that you think about contacting, if you are interested, other organisations. In the handout, there's a national website which you can find contact details for Ukrainian from other or associations all around Australia. In Tasmania, our our first meeting in Hobart was in January 1954, in Launceston in the 18th of January 1959. We came together in 1961 as a community. There are records dating back from 54. Some of these are actually in the state archives. They're in Ukrainian. We translated them, so maybe hopefully in the future we can um, get something happening. But um, there are records from that period. And, of course, from Mada developed all around Australia. In Hobart, um, we had the Milka. We have the Milka now in Moona, which is a community house. Um, the, in 1948, the building committee was formed, um, bought some land in Montrose, built a house, sold the um, sold the land, bought a house, uh, bought a house in Moona, renovated the house, so it now looks like the brick building that you see in the slide. This is all very very quick and I'm not doing it any justice, but just to give you an overview of what happened. And then, so in Moona now, our building does not look like that. It's a big brick building, a big um, rented building with the Ukrainian flag on the top um, because we moved from there in 2005. In Launceston, they had an active community as well, smaller. Um, they started built, talking about building in 1959 um, and... I'm just trying to see. They purchased the block of land in 1961. And so they had they actually had the Milko before Hobart did. So the community was growing right from quite early when people started to arrive. The role of women, so in like other Eastern European um, communities at that time, men did the majority in Hobart, did the majority of the administration and the committee sort of work. In Launceston, it was a bit more shared, actually. They had women who were on the committee who were secretaries and, and so on. But in Hobart, it was more male-dominated at that time. So women had a very important role of preservers of culture and tradition. We had a Ukrainian Women's Association in Australia. Um, we had a branch for a very short time in the 70s. Um, and they provided leadership and um, there was a small membership as well in that in that branch. So 
you know, things like make, organising um, cooking for events, organising events, supporting the development of schools and, and all those things were, were done by women as well as men. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we had a, um, a Greek Catholic church and a, or Byzantinian Catholic rite, sorry, and an Orthodox church. Both of these were um, in Western Ukraine at that time. So we had these institutions in Hobart as well. The Orthodox community had a, they built a church in um, West Hobart, and whereas the Catholic community worshipped in within the hall itself and had priests coming to visit from Melbourne. So at the moment, we still have a chapel in the hall in Moona and the Orthodox community is welcome. Um, they, there's a Catholic chapel and the Orthodox community is welcome whenever and however they wish to come. Um, and the community has worshipped together for over time as well. Community activities, I'm nearly there. I think we'll be okay. Um, all right, so community activities. We, of course, had choir, musical groups, dance groups, Saturday school, academic year, which is a educational um, commemorative style event um, to, to commemorate heroes. We also had Ohiroi. We had a union of Ukrainian combatants, so those people who, who fought in the battles for independence that, for that very short period, 1917, 1919, as well. So it was a very active community, and there's lots of photos in our book. I didn't put them in here because otherwise we'd be here for hours, but there are lots of really interesting images. We had a scouting group, a soccer group, a soccer club, and lots of food and lots of gathering with community. I've just got an image here of how we started our histor historical project um, a couple of years ago. We did some consulting, we had a brainstorm, we commenced our project and engaged the community the whole time to try and gather data and information to help to create as diverse a publication as we could. It only took us a year and a half, but it I probably <laughs> felt like a little bit longer. It was a very in-depth project and we published in 2019 and launched in January 2020. And now, of course, I'm just going to skip through here. As I said, Ukraine became independent in 1991. We have limited information about um, migration from 1940, uh, 1954 to 1991. There's not a large migration during that time. From There is a little bit in English um, around from 1991 until now, but um, in the interest of time, I won't go into that for now. I just wanted to touch on what has been recent events and the impacts that can have on researching your community history. So in 2014, there was the Revolution um, of Dignity, which is, based, is the precursor to what is happening in Ukraine at the moment. So the war in Ukraine didn't start on the 24th of February. Um, it started six, eight years ago in 2014. And now we have refugees coming or displaced people coming to Australia again, like we did in 1948 to 1954, which is a really very um, unfortunate and sad synergy. So I've just got an image here of what the um, situation is in Ukraine at the moment. It gives you um, just an insight into the territory. So this was on August 26th as to how much was under Russian um, control, or perceived Russian control at that time. So obviously the, the impact of this means that finding your family in Ukraine at the moment is very problematic in terms of being there physically. So I encourage you to do what you can online, find what you can, talk to people. There are professional um, companies that do this um, and can do some of this work for you, particularly if you don't speak Russian, Latin, German, Ukrainian <laughs> and all the other things. There are all the other languages. There are a few books um, that I've put there that I have also in your handout which provide a general overview of Ukrainian history that um, I found them very useful and they answer some really pertinent questions about um, the history of Ukraine and the complexity, particularly in the eastern region and where Russia had such an influence for a long time. I'd like to acknowledge the State Library of Tasmania Thank you very much for the opportunity to present um, the Ukrainian community for their expertise. I could not have done it without at least a couple of people who know who they are, who 
contributed significantly to this presentation. Um, Dr. Stefan Petro and Dr. Diane Snowden, thank you for your support and also to community members and friends who are here and listening. Um, we can't do this alone, we have to do it together. So thank you. Let's just keep collaborating, keep talking. It's all we can do in this space, it's so complex. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> thank you very much. And, and, well, thank you very much, Marina, and thank you all for attending this talk. I learned so much, and it's actually, it was a very rich presentation, actually, about methodology, about how we approach research, not just pertinent to Ukrainian archives, but also to how we look at the archives we have here for any research. Um, I, yeah, would love to, you know, see you again some other time and I look forward to seeing these slides up on YouTube for anyone who missed. I noticed the people furiously taking notes. So does anyone have any questions? Because I am, am willing now to hand over the mic. If anyone would like to address anything, if, if you hear it on the webinar. Even if you have a general question about the community and or what we do or just anything, I'll, as I said, I'll answer what I can. Doesn't mean I might have it, have it but I'll try. Yeah. Or you can always contact us again and we can get a question put through to Marina for a reference inquiry. We would love to do that. And of course, Marina's brought the amazing and beautiful book that she helped compile and edit, collate, I'm sure. So yeah, please stay. And I do need to mention that um, with tomorrow's talk, for anyone that has missed the email, it has actually been cancelled. Uh, um, so we don't have a replacement talk at this stage, but we do have a bonus talk on Thursday, um, which will be with one of our archivists, Sally Marchant, about um, researching your family home in Tasmania. History. Oh, house history. House history in Tasmania. All right, so thank you very much, and thank you again to Marina. Thank you so much for having me.